Welcome back to Archaeology After Dark, everyone. I'm, of course, your lovable host, Daniel Rhodes. My guest today is Dr. Paige Ford. Paige, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I, my name is Dr. Paige Ford. Uh, I work with the Arkansas Archaeological Survey as a station archaeologist at Plum Bayou Mounds Archaeological State Park, which is just southeast of Little Rock, like about 20 minutes. Uh, so there I work with park staff and do research, public outreach, preservation activities to you know mitigate mound erosion and things with some of the stuff we're working on now. Uh, but a bit about myself, I am relatively new to this position. Um, I got my PhD from the University of Oklahoma and finished in 2021 and moved out here and just immediately started work. Um, I am a public archaeologist, a community archaeologist, so I do a lot of public outreach and think a lot about how my work affects communities and how I can involve different communities in that work. Uh, and I am a ceramicist by trade, so I specialize in Native American ceramics and manufacture and decoration as well as uh, looking at regional intera interactions uh, using those. So that's just a little brief snapshot of myself, I guess, and, and what I do in my experience. And that brings us to the numerous things that we talk about on this program. Uh, mound sites, South Asian archaeology, ceramics, community projects, all rolled into one. So, we aim to please. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think people will notice that Plum Bayou's name had actually changed not too long ago. Uh, what was the reason behind that? Yeah, so the name used to be Toltec Mounds Archaeological State Park. Um, and it's, it's actually a really interesting and not necessarily long, but an interesting history. Um, and one of the things is... If you know about mound sites in the southeast, you know that in the 1800s, there was a lot of uh, kind of misinformation about who built the mounds. So there were theories, uh, some of them more believable than others, uh, before a lot of archaeological work was done. And one of those was that Toltecs from Mesoamerica, because it's Mesoamerican culture, actually built the mounds uh, in the southeast United States. And that stems from a few different reasons. But that's kind of, it's sort of where the name comes from, uh, is the the Knapp family themselves uh, believed that theory to be true until we believe the Smithsonian came out in the 1800s as part of their mound building excavations. They, you know, told them it was Native Americans through their investigations. Um, but the Knapps were... Uh, they established like a, a small railroad uh, stop there. They named it Toltec. And at some point, the site just kept being called Toltec for the adjacent community that they had named. And so when state parks acquired the land in 1960 something uh, and established the park, they named it Toltec because that was what the community called this the site. And that's what the community surrounding the site was called as well. Um, but it's a good change. We worked with a lot of people to get that done. Uh, and it, it's a good compromise. But, you know, you know, we it's hard because Plum Bayou itself, like archaeologists assign that name to the culture. So it's not the actual culture name, um, but it's better than uh, attributing it to an entirely different, uh, different culture itself. So but yeah, that was pretty cool to be a part of. Yeah. Yeah, so I was just thinking the Mesoamerican theory doesn't exactly hold water anymore, does it? No, um, I mean, you know, there's certain elements like some crops that kind of migrated up this way, you know, from there. Um, but the connections are really loose and it's there's not it doesn't really hold water anymore, much like giants and aliens and other things don't don't hold any water either. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, people see a wonderful feat of engineering and they automatically assume, oh, uh, a space person made this. We get a lot of that. It's an it's an interesting place to work, especially because people come from all over and all different experiences and and uh, educations and backgrounds. Uh, and I've heard some pretty interesting things said about the mounds themselves. Um, 
one woman came in re relatively recently and uh, she threw out something that I had, I actually hadn't heard before. Um, giants were involved, but it was that the mounds themselves were, well, they're burials of giants, but it was because the Native Americans had battled the giants and had buried their like slain giants in these mounds. Uh, and that was what the resultant mounds were, was just huge giant barrels in the result of this huge battle. And she asked the question, you know, if Native Americans could um, battle and defeat giants, how couldn't, like, why couldn't they defeat the white man? And it was, I'd never heard or been asked that question before. Uh, and it was, it was interesting. And she asked a park interpreter and the interpreter did an amazing job answering her. Uh, but I've never heard that one before. <laughs> Yeah, that's the fun thing about when you work with the public, you get questions like that and you just kind of have to roll with it despite, you know, the instinct to say, well, that's none of that is actually true. So, yeah, it's it's an inter you you learn kind of like the prevailing theories of the time kind of by working there, because, I mean, we have hundreds of people come in every week um, and the common threat giants are mentioned a whole lot. And it seemed like there's punctuated, like a lot of people come in and mention giants and then it will fall off and you won't hear it for a little bit. And then it's just like a weird ebb and flow of people coming in uh, asking about, oh, where are the giants? You know? Yeah, I can't help but wonder if it, you know, corresponds to like a social media trend, like some new theory comes up and they're like, oh, well, there's a site like that near me. I wonder if it's the same thing. Probably. Yeah. Social media is like changed the way that people learn about things and like when because we have since it's a ceremonial site and it's a ceremonial mound center that we have a lot of folks that show up for like solstice equinox uh various like solar alignments because so we have some solar alignments on site and uh recently there for the summer solstice so like 50 some people came out in a group uh, and they had watched a YouTube video by a woman who called herself an oracle and said that somebody was going to present themselves like at the site, like it was about Plum Bayou Mounds, uh, which she called Toltec Mounds. Um, and yeah, it was this huge group of people that showed up with crystals and and everything, and and it was it was it was wild. I wasn't there because I took the day off because that's my birthday, uh, so I missed the festivities, but. Uh, I, I was told later that there was much, there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, folks out there. So Plum Bayou, what was the site actually used for aside from battling of giants and crystal charging? Yeah, so uh, the site, it's a, it's a late woodland mound site. So it's actually, it's pre-Mississippian. So it dates, the construction of the site dates from around 8650 to 1050, thereabouts. Uh, it has 18 mounds on site with an earthen embankment wall uh, surrounding three sides and then an, an oxbow lake on the west side. Uh, there are also two plazas. Um, so the site itself, it's ceremonial. We don't have any evidence of residential structures. Uh, so people were coming here for rituals and feasts and ceremonies, uh, perhaps marking time in some way. Um, we don't know this. I mean, archaeology can only tell you so much, right? Uh, so we don't know the significance of some of those events. Um, but we do have at least one feasting mound with a heavy concentration of animal bone, plant remains, cooking, cutting tools, serving vessels, a lot of that. Uh, so we know they were definitely gathering for feasts um and other rituals and ceremonies we have some ritual artifacts as well on site uh, that are kind of more special purpose items uh so place of of worship and uh coming together so when all the people came to together to celebrate i assume it's like a seasonal feast like since it wasn't or you can't prove they're residential it was like a just certain times of the year thing yeah i th that's that's what we think now um is you know it's just punctuated like certain times of the year and that probably changed because i mean the site was used for several hundred years from 650 to 1050 and 
So the timing of those events might change. The significance might change. But yeah, it's people coming periodically through the year uh, to celebrate certain seasonal events, uh, certain occasions, uh, what those might be. Not not really sure at this point. But So what's the ongoing research at Plum Bayou? I assume since I assume it's a NAGPRA site, so you can't, you know, actively investigate on a regular basis. Yeah, it not only so we have at least one burial mound on site as well as others other places where burials are found because if a mound isn't a burial mound doesn't mean there's not burials in it. Um, but we have uh, it is a, a nag per site. It's also a protected uh, landmark. So we try to do as little impact as possible uh, for everything that we do. And so now um, most of what we do is preservation uh, research there, uh, and then some limited testing if we need to. Uh, we do a lot of, we work with the staff there to do a lot of maintenance um, to, you know, because it's a state park, you want things to look nice and you got to replace signage, which means you got to make sure there aren't artifacts and features where you're putting your signs. Uh, right now at the site, we've had a pretty severe slump event on the back side of one of the mounds on the lake facing side of one of the mounds. And so the new research we're working on now is to investigate the cause and causes of those slumps. Cause it's not the only slump that's ever happened. I mean, these are large mounds. So, and they've existed for a thousand years. So, uh, but we'll be doing some geoarchaeology on site to investigate the cause of that. And then to come up with mitigation strategies for this specific slump. And then, for ones that might happen in the future. And then not at the site, but in the region, we have Plum Bayou Village sites that need new research done on them. We don't have a lot of data from Plum Bayou Villages. Most of our data on Plum Bayou people comes from Plum Bayou Mounds, which is the ceremonial site. And so we don't have a clear snapshot of a lot of like the regular everyday kind of aspects of Plum Bayou people's lives. So we're going to hopefully uh, do some investigations and excavations on surrounding village sites to get some of that data too. So when you talk about the surrounding area, how big of an area are we talking about? Because I mean, I assume that includes the park itself or the site, but the area around it also. Yeah, I mean, it's it's multi-county. Um, it's hard to really say how big, just because there, there's been a few, like a couple surveys done. There's one done in the 80s, and then a station archaeologist uh, prior to myself uh, started to redo that survey work. Um, but it is, it's a multi-county area pretty centered on, on central Arkansas. Um, and it's hard to say really how big, but it's 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 several counties at least. Um, but it's this kind of entire central region, and it, we don't really know how far it extends. It's like it's like every culture area. You don't really know how far it extends, and then we also don't super know how Blum Bayou relates to some of the other Coles Creek folks out in the Mississippi area, and then we don't know how it relates to in in Oklahoma. Uh, it's called Fush Malin at that time period. And so we have a lot of gray areas to figure out, you know, the relationships of these various, you know, culture groups that uh, that archaeologists have defined prior to myself. So how does this add to uh, or change the way people see archaeology in Arkansas? Because I each site brings its own like story to the grand scheme of things. So how does Plum Bayou add to that? Um it how it adds to the archaeology story? Yeah. Or just um, archae or just Arkansas in general. Um it tells us for for archaeology specifically, one of the I know one of the big questions is how Plum Bayou mounds relates to the later Mississippian cultures, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of the mound building practices are very similar. Um, and it's, you know, uh, the questions are about how it relates to that. Some of the theories say that, you know, 
uh, Plum Bayou people um, may be in some way related to uh, Cahokia. Some say they're not, they, these folks did not become Mississippian because there are a lot of dissimilarities as well. Um, so understanding more about Plum Bayou people can maybe help us understand a little bit more about some of the emergent Mississippian stuff, um, what they might have taken from it, uh, what they might not have. Um, so that's one of the big contributions. And then two, it tells us a lot, and this is um, my predecessor, Dr. Liz Horton, has done a lot of research on this uh, in learning about uh, some of the earliest domesticates um, at this time period, uh, doing some research on human manipulation of plants uh, and how those interactions lead to, you know, better yields uh, domestication that you see like really intensify in that Mississippian period. So the mound sites that are just scattered all over the Southeast, you know, they vary from bit to bit. So how, trying to phrase this correctly, how, when did, I guess, people stop using Plum Bayou as like a ceremonial site? Like each mound site was i guess not so much abandoned but just like left yeah yeah so plum bay mounds the the mound building as far as we know right now because we still there's not a lot of data from some of the areas of the site um from what we know right now um uh the mound building ceased at that 80 10 50 but Mississippian folks, the Mississippians of the time, uh, right after that, they revisit the site uh, and reuse it for certain things. We have Mississippian period burials on site. Uh, there's not a lot of Mississippian activity at Plum Bayou Mounds, but they're at least revisiting and know it as a special place of some kind, of some importance. Um, so it never really stops being used. And I think that's that's one of the things about like mound building sites is I, they're never really abandoned. I think they're just redefined uh, by either the cultures that built them or by, you know, people who come across them, um, uh, people who have a, a knowledge of them from family members or ancestors. Um, the significance of them might change and this, you know, the, but they're never really stopped like being used in other sense, even when you get on into like post European contact, like people are still coming out there and they're like, what is this place? Like, this is an interesting, and some kinds, sometimes they call it a spooky place because, you know, um, you've got these huge mounds out in the middle of like the Delta and you know they come out of nowhere um but people encounter them and can see them as some kind of special place uh but i like to think of the fact that even though mound building might end it's not the end of the story for those sites it's just people are constantly redefining what they mean and what they were used for uh you know as well so you brought up an interesting point. I think the mentality that people have or had, you know, when they first arrived here, at least the European uh, perspective still maintains today. Like we still go to mound sites and we're still wowed by the feats of engineering that, you know, it takes so many baskets of clay and mud to actually make this thing happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's an incredible, um, an incredible feat. And I think, Two, um, a lot of us don't realize like it's not even just about, you know, the labor cost of, you know, building something like that uh, without like bulldozers and, you know, backhoes and everything like that. It's also it takes a lot of engineering knowledge, too, because like soils have different properties. Uh, they'll stack differently. And then because you're using these mounds sometimes to hold structures, it has to be structurally sound uh, in order to hold those structures. Uh, then you have the maintenance of them because they will slump, they will erode. We know that, you know, and we're not adding to them anymore. And we're not regularly like maintaining them like they would have been. Um, 
but they're incredible feats of engineering. And I think even if, you know, you don't connect necessarily with the idea that these are uh, very special ceremonial spaces, you can have a respect for what it took to build, like to build them. Because it's a lot of knowledge. Some of that is like curated knowledge through generations. Um, but it takes a lot of, of, of work to build those and planning to on where you're placing things, especially if there's significance to the placement and the alignments. Uh, it's an incredible amount of work uh, there. And the for the Plum Bayou time period, this late woodland time period, it's not where we think of, you know, chiefdoms necessarily. This is like prior to a lot of that. So you're seeing all of this happen before we get those intensifications of those, that social ladder kind of thing. You probably see some of that, uh, but it's not, you know, as intense as you see in later time periods. Yeah, I was just thinking about the, you mentioned the maintenance and the mounds, you know, losing pieces of themselves. And I imagine that was, you know, a fairly regular thing for people who were actually using them at a regular, on a regular basis, just because of everyday, like foot traffic, the weather that we all curse here in the Southeast. Yeah. It, it, you know, um, even though people probably weren't like living at the site year round, you probably had a significant amount of folks who were having to come and maintain the site. And then two, after you have your ceremonies and rituals and feasts and whatever you're having, those plaza spaces where everybody is, you know, having a good time and, you know, celebrating or, or uh, practicing something, you have to clean those spaces. Uh, so it's not even just about the mound maintenance itself. It's also about cleaning the spaces and preparing them for the next whatever, whenever that might be. Um, and I think, you know, that we none of us think about that unless you work at a mound site and you've actively been working at a mound site. Like these are things you don't necessarily think of that like, oh, well, you've got to, there's a lot of cleaning, there's a lot of maintenance because these are tall structures and, you know, the soil uh, will move, you know, by like, living on it, moving on it, climbing up and down it, it just, it's going to move. And even the maintenance, like that takes a lot of planning too. And we're seeing that now as we're building some of the erosion researches that even that research takes a lot of time to really design and figure out what's going to be best and what's going to have the least amount of impact on the original structure so that then you can shore them back up in similar ways as to what the Plumayu people might have actually done. Yeah, and that, again, tells us something that's, you know, significant about the site is that people felt that the site was significant enough to do that kind of maintenance, you know, not, like you said, not year round, but on a regular enough basis to where they felt it needed to be presentable at certain times of the year. Yeah, for sure. It's it, it's crazy to think about. It's like mind numbing to think about on a, on a certain level. Um, but like, so we're working uh, with uh, Dr. Sarah Sherwood, who has done uh, a lot of similar projects in the Southeast investigating mound erosion. And her, she and T.R. Kidder have a, a paper that I think, I think it's one of the more famous papers about mound building and geoarchaeology and, you know, engineering. It's called Da Vinci's of Dirt. Uh, and it really like just outlines, there's so many different ways to build mounds and to make sure that your mounds are going to last uh, yeah. for a long time and for whatever they're going to be used for. There were so many different strategies for how they were built uh, and engineered. And it's when you're dealing with mound erosion, one of the things you have to figure out how it was built. Uh, you have to figure out how it was built so that you can make sure your, uh, your mitigation plan is going to, you know, at a certain level mimic what, they were doing originally because they clearly had a plan uh for how to make these structures last i mean they for the most part lasted for a thousand years so uh they've done a great job of you know holding up to a certain level i mean there's some things you can't you know change like plowing and things and land leveling but uh some of the bigger mounds that we see have lasted for you know thousands of years so Pretty cool. So let, let me ask you this is I know parts of Plum Bayou are actually on the lake or bayou. Um, I assume the mounds that are closer to that are 
at more of a risk from erosion than the ones that are, I guess, closer inland in the site? Yeah, our uh, lake levels right now are are much higher than they would have been at the time that Plum Bayou people were building the site. Um, and so we have a lot of mound erosion on that lake facing side. There are some, so the, the one that's that's slumped currently is, you know, it does get inundated quite frequently. Um, and part of the original base, uh, if you stand on top of the mound, you can kind of see where the original slope goes and it goes kind of underneath where the lake currently is. Um, but then we have some mounds that were built even closer uh, to the lake itself. And those are almost entirely gone. Um, there's one uh, Mount P that we do regular surface collection on to try and at least quantify uh, the uh, uh, amount of loss. And you can see the like these lenses of soil that it kind of breaks your brain a little bit. And you're like, is this still part of the mound? Like, but it's just, there are these lenses that are like chock full of artifacts. And you're just like, is this part of the mound or is this just like, is it coming from up there? Like, where is it like, is it like in the shore? And it, it like boggles your mind, but yeah, we have a lot of that lake facing side. Um, there's a lot of erosion on it. So how do you document the erosive process? I, I assume erosive is a word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really hard. I'll say that. Uh, <laughs> Um, we've played around with a few different kinds of strategies, but the difficulty, it's so difficult, uh, especially when you have an active, uh, lake that's like rising and falling, and then you've got wave action and rain and all this stuff. Um, we have some established controlled surface collection grids that we regularly revisit. Um, so the control that we kind of get is, you know, um, how many artifacts are coming out because getting the kind of soil volume that's lost is really hard um we've played around with putting there's like pins and stuff you can put in and you kind of measure uh how much loss that way but for the shoreline and some of these mounds it's difficult because soil is deposited and then taken back and deposited and taken back so it's kind of hard to quantify that way um we have recently played around with, and we'll be presenting some of this at SEAC with doing photogrammetry using uh, using drones uh, to try and monitor uh, that. Uh, but then you have there's limitations to that uh, as well, it, which is vegetation and other things. You know, unless you're really good at flying a drone um, through trees, but <laughs> I'm not. Uh, and I'm not, I'm one of our station archaeologists, Dr. Emily Beam is the one that's piloting the drone. Uh, so I think from a long-term standpoint, um, eventually we'll be seeking some LIDAR enabled uh, drones to really heavily monitor it as well as like, I've been playing around with the idea. So there's a, a boardwalk that goes behind the largest mound, Mound A, um, that has the current slump. And um because I, I like to think about how to involve communities as much as possible. Um, and I've been playing around with the idea of like citizen science erosion monitoring through like photo submissions at the very least uh, mm -hmm. to see if we can get, get people learning about what's going on. And then also, you know, if we're not able to go out there and uh, get some, some form of uh, data. Um, but so there's ways, but it takes trial and error and we're figuring it out. So uh, folks watching this, uh, please do not send or do send your photographs of the site to Paige so she can look at them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you see some, say some. That's what they say, right? <laughs> yeah. Like don't don't send her your random selfies. Please try to make them, you know, relevant to what she's trying to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't send me just ran you know, ran up like I found a bird. Like, no, that's good. <laughs> but I mean, sometimes you need the feel good vibe. So if you have like cute pictures of your animals, feel free to send those to us. We always appreciate that. Yeah, we'll take cat, dog photos, bird photos, lizards, whatever you got. Just just feel good vibe photos. So 
Paige, for anyone who wants to get interested in Plum Bayou or visit the site or get interested in archaeology, what would you recommend for them? Oh, so many things. Uh, <laughs> it's the best There's question. So, many things. Uh, so for Plum Bayou specifically, uh, there are several publications that you can find uh, on the Arkansas Survey's website. So if you just Google Arkansas Archaeological Survey, it'll pop up. There's a publications tab. Um, and we have like more academic publications. And then there are some free resources too, if you're just interested and want to read about what it is. Um, if you want to come visit, come visit. Uh, the park is open Wednesdays through Sundays. Wednesday through Saturday, it's open 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And Sundays, it's open 1 to 5. Um, you might even see me because I've got a fishbowl lab and you can, you know, peer in and look and see what we're doing in archaeology. Um, if you're interested in volunteering and you're local to the Little Rock or Central Arkansas region, um, we're getting our uh, society chapter, our avocational society chapter back up and running. And at my lab, we do uh, lab days. So you can get your hands on some artifacts uh, and work with us uh, on curation and, and research. Um, yeah, and then in, in terms of just archeology span in general, just, you know, there's no harm in ever reaching out to an archeologist and just asking them what's up and asking them questions. I love talking to people uh, that are interested and working with people that are interested and in getting them experience. Um, and then to read a lot read things. Reading is good. Yes. Uh, find what you're interested in, you know, uh, and just read about it. Uh, read about archaeology, ask questions, ask people what to read. But reading is, is, is important. And then, you know, watching, uh, watching things like, like this podcast uh, can be really Thank helpful you. too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, the, all that advice comes along with the advice of also double check the sources from where your publications are coming from. You know, people like Paige and I will recommend that it come from, you know, an actual academic institution, preferably like a university or a lab. But if you happen to find something that is credible or seems credible, still double check it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because yeah, that, definitely double check. You'll get some like giants and alien stuff. Yeah, I was just about to say that you get the theories of giants being in the ground and aliens with their space lizards or whatever. Yeah, space lizards. Yeah, I've heard space. Oh, now I'm going to hear space lizards. Somebody, somebody's going to come in and say space lizards. I know it now. Yeah, now that, I, now, now that I've put it out there, someone's going to come talk to me about it too. So I look forward to that conversation well, well put it in the world manifested that yeah that's time. what I, that's what i get for you know going with the flow <laughs> <Just theory. laughs> karma it's what it is karma. well Paige, thank you so much for being here i really enjoyed having you on the show yeah yeah it was awesome it's cool well, that was going to do it for today's episode, everybody. Take care and stay tuned for more because Archaeology Month isn't over yet.